So I'll start with the case. This was a 60-year-old man who presented with discharge from Olecranon for about a month. He had stiffness of elbow for a lights for a long time, almost one and a half years. And uh, five months before he presented to us, you can see the X-ray. There's a large lytic area in the Olecranon. A general surgeon did uh, IND abscess. He was given antibiotics for three weeks. And after that, he was little better for some time and then he developed a sinus. So one month before he approached to us, uh, there was a sinus. Two weeks before he came to us, the swab was taken, which was MSSA and he was on appropriate antibiotics. Now this is how he is. He has a sinus, he has two incisions, has a flexion deformity of 30 degrees and further flexion is up to about 90 degrees. His pronosupination is markedly restricted and that's the X-ray presentation. There's a large lytic area in olecranon. The space between radius and humerus has decreased, maybe because of, because of the positioning. Inflammatory markers were significantly raised. You can see there's an infection all around the elbow, the head of humerus, the olecranon. There is a sinus tract going down as well as uh, effusion and synovial hypertrophy in elbow. So this is where we are. Question is, what do we do? Do we continue MSSA? Do we aspirate and confirm the diagnosis? And if it turns out to be Cox, it will settle with anti-TB drugs or we operate. So how many for biopsy? Majority are for biopsy. So you think that essentially with anti-TB drugs, it would help improve, correct? How many for exploration? Why would you explore? Why would you explore? Is there any classification system to give us guidelines? In elbow, there has to be some guideline, isn't it? Or I would, like, like spine people say that it is essentially a medical disease. Yes, extra-articular also, extra-spinal is also a medical disease. How do I decide when I operate? So in elbow, the, which will probably help management of other joints also, but elbow. There is an excellent paper by uh, Mandeep Dhillon and all, a clinical radiological diagnosis. And they have classified this, given guidelines when you operate and when you can conserve. So this was after analysis of almost 40 elbows, 38 patients. And the most common were olecranon, or olecranon coronoid junction lesions. This was a modification of Martini's classification, uh, Dillon's classification. So stage one, obviously no bony involvement. That is the most benign thing. Stage four, where the elbow is totally destroyed. In between, of course, you have an, a spectrum. So stage two is extra-articular involvement. That is either in epicondyle or uh, olecranon, but not going into the joint. Stage 3A was extra articular, but it's about to uh, threatening to break open into the joint. And 3B is where there is an intra articular involvement. So 1 and 2 are essentially not involving the joint, 3 and 4 are involving the joint. So the general roadmap they have suggested is. After confirming the diagnosis, ATT and physiotherapy for 1 and 2, stage 1 and 2. Stage 3, A as well as B, debridement, surgery, debridement and ATT. Stage 4, you can't really salvage the joint. But in case there is a problem, he has got a lot of pain, the sinus is not settling, then one can exp uh, do the surgery. What were the results? Why have they classified this? So the results in stage one were, of course, there was only one patient. It's not all that common, was excellent. Stage two, again, extra articular, not going into the joint, generally good results. Stage three A, again, 
it is threatening into the joint but it is not broken into the joint good results but moment it goes into the joint the results were very very not satisfying fine at all 12 out of 17 had fair result none of them had good result and 5 out of 17 had poor result so essentially you have to see to it that the stage 3a does not go to 3b and that is why you should explore and in this particular case obviously he had an involvement of the joint so he did need surgery now what were their outcomes first and foremost they said that pronosupination recovery of pronosupination is very poor only about 17 out of 38 patients had good more than 90 degrees pronosupination and many of them were painful not every day but on exertion so in this case this we have already discussed so as compared to spine where stability is very important here especially in upper limbs you need mobile joints maybe in foot you would need stability but in upper limb elbow you need mobility so in this case whether it is cox or not i have to explore if it is septic obviously i have to explore and in cox because of the lesion is 3b i have to explore so question was how do i take an incision so first and foremost the sinus has to be included in the incision sinus tract needs to be excised and then you need to go in so this is we have excised the sinus tract then you can see very often the sinus the cloaca is very small and then you tend to say that oh there is hardly anything inside you must widen that opening you can see the opening appears very small but the there is a large collection inside there is a large collection inside so this is after synovectomy histopathology was cox we started four drugs akt pan sensitive tb uh, this is at 3 and 6 weeks the culture grew this is x ray at 5 months and this is at a year when we stopped anti tb drugs he has almost full pronation but again as discussed in the paper there was hardly any supination so essentially the movements improved improved to a large extent but he did not have fantastic movement but of course working wise there was no problem so general road map 1 and 2 conservative if operate only if they don't settle in 4 to 6 weeks or maybe longer 3 surgery whether it is a and b and 4 surgery only if only if there is a problem only if a patient has persistent sinus or very severe pain and you want to fuse but otherwise there is no need for surgery coming to tuberculosis of the foot it could be a cavitatory lesion or a large defect these are the most common things this man presented with a sinus you can see non healing ulcer on the not uh, on the medial aspect of the foot going on for 6 months but finally he presented not for that he presented for a non healing ulcer which had refused healing in spite of two skin graftings that is why he had come so he had very mild pain while walking and when i examined him carefully there was a sinus so he has a sinus and an ulcer question is is it tb is the ulcer tuberculous is the sinus tuberculous so you can see this ulcer was certainly not likely to be tb the tb ulcers are generally thin bluish most important they have undermined edges and a sort of pale granulation tissue while here the granulation tissue was excellent it was actually appeared to be fit for a graft still it had not healed and uh, so probably it was secondary secondary to persistent discharge from the sinus so we got an mri done which showed a cavitatory lesion and uh, so i felt that with a sinus with a large lesion which is likely to burst into the joint he definitely need surgery the question is what kind of incision do i take as i said it is always best to excise the sinus and then go in this is a paper by dr mandeep dilan uh, sampad dumre patil and myself on role of surgery in management of 
osteoarticular tuberculosis of foot and ankle. So based on that, we excised the sinus and went in. You can see the granulation tissue popping out from that lesion which we scraped and there was a large cavity in the talus but the walls were quite thick, very strong. So we just probed everywhere and realized that the walls are very strong. It is not likely to likely to collapse. So we decided not to do any kind of bone grafting. About skin graft, since we felt that this is a secondary ulcer, we did not do any grafting, skin grafting. This is at two weeks, you can see the ulcer has healed. So that suggests that this was a secondary ulcer because of the, <coughs> this is at six weeks, the culture was positive. So we continued for drug treatment. This is at two years when he had no pain doing jumping, running. This is at four years, he has maintained no recurrence and that's the x-ray, the, the walls have really thickened well and this is at 13 years when it's absolutely for 13 years he has had no problems at all. And uh, you can see the cavity is totally reconstituted. Coming back to shoulder, now this is a uh, young boy, 15 months has a discharging sinus in the right shoulder for he had no pain doing jumping running this is at four years he has maintained no recurrence and that's the x-ray the the walls have really thickened well and this is at 13 years when it's absolutely for 13 years he has had no problems at all and uh, you can see the cavity is totally reconstituted Coming back to shoulder, now this is a uh, young boy, 15 months, has a discharging sinus in the right shoulder for two months. This appears to be a tuberculous sinus. It just fits into the description. Now, f has a very funny history. Shoulder pain for two months. The x-ray showed lytic areas with facial irregularity and the concerned person thought this is probably malignant. So he referred to Dr. Manish Agarwal, our oncosurgeon. He did a CT guided biopsy, which turned out to be the histopathology was caseous granuloma. And therefore he referred to a pediatrician who started him on anti-TB drugs, appropriate anti-TB drugs by a pediatrician. Unfortunately, the pain continued. And he developed a sinus two months after starting ATT. Initially, there was no sinus. After two months, he started ATT. So he repeated his MRI, which showed much more extensive lesion. Question is why? He has pan-sensitive disease. ATT was given by an, a good person with appropriate doses. And it is said that Ma bhuki rahegi. They will never, they will cannot be defaulters as far as pediatrics is concerned. So what do I do? Do I explore? Do I start second line? Dr. Aisha, would you like to help us with that? Should I start anti second line empirically? I think the first thing that we have to consider again over here is look at the patient, right? It's a young child, a few months old. Look at the region that is involved, yeah? Uh, it's the shoulder, it's the right shoulder. Oh, yeah, right shoulder. And uh, in patients, especially young children, a few months old, with involvement of the arm or the shoulder, you have to think of regional bcg yeah? Now, I understand that this patient had a report done elsewhere which was pan-susceptible, but I wonder if they had just based the initial ATT on a gene expert yeah. which must have shown drift susceptibility, but not bothered to do an entire DST which might have yielded a different picture. Okay. So, I think you'll yeah, come to that. Like. So, since the lesion had increased, we decided to explore. You can see this. And when you decide to explore, go all the way. Don't do a, you know, chota sa debridement. Do a thorough, thorough debridement. And uh, here you can see the cavity which we have scraped. And uh, 
again sent for everything. The gene expert was positive, no refer resistance, granulation tissue, and the pediatrician said, Ki, no, I mean, there could be resistance to something, some other drug. And he added moxifloxacin and cyclosin. I said, what nonsense. What is he doing, Dr. Aisha? So once again, when you're thinking of a BCGosis, you have to remember that the, um, I'll come here, sorry. You have to remember that the BCG vaccine is created from M. bovis, Mycobacterium bovis. And if you can come here and... Sure. So, Mycobacterium bovis typically is pyrazinamide monoresistant. It's sensitive to all the other drugs and pyrazinamide monoresistant. So, remember this when you see a patient. It's a very unusual susceptibility pattern to find. But when we have seen pyrazinamide monoresistance, you either see it in a young child with BCGosis or rarely you see it in a patient who has undergone intravesical BCG treatment for CA of the bladder, yeah, which causes in some patients a regional or a disseminated infection. So this yeah. patient clearly had yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So what the pediatrician did was absolutely right. He suspected something. He added two drugs and it turned out to be pyrazinamide monoresistance and it is Bovis is essentially resistant to pyrazinamide. Uh, we didn't do any grafting. Generally, children really recover very well. So this is at nine months, has a decent range of movement, and is at five years post-op. Uh, absolutely no restriction of anything. And in fact, they got an X-ray done which was reported as normal. So to you can see the bone, how bone can heal well. So friends, the take home will be always biopsy every lytic lesion. Don't take TB for granted. Do not, in case person is not settling, do not hesitate to repeat culture. Do not hesitate to do resurgery. And finally, do not underestimate the power of mother nature, especially in pediatric age group. Thank you friends.